Welcome to the first episode of War Masters Workshop Master Class. This is the 301 class that uh, I'll be teaching so that you can learn how to build your own set of uh, hyper-realistic Mandalorian armor, be it out of metal or uh, even plastic or uh, fiberglass. Uh, I'll mostly be focusing on metal um, as far as our base material for building the armor. Um, we'll also get into some uh, advanced electronics and things of that nature as we go through these. But for today, um, we're going to learn the basic tools necessary for starting um, work on man metal Mandalorian armor. So the first most important tool that you need is this. This is a dishing stump. Um, it doesn't matter what surface you want to use. You can use a uh, you can use a stump like I have here. You can use what's called a uh, a leather shot bag, which is just a heavy, thick leather bag filled with uh, a buckshot. Or you can use uh, something like the underside of a uh, of an old oxygen tank, um, like an old welding oxygen tank. If you can find one of those in a scrapyard, the underside of it is a nice bowl, and uh, perfect for dishing. Um, they're a little bit loud but they're great for dishing so um, anyway I'll tell you a little bit about uh, about Lucille here which is my dishing stump and uh, what all I use her for now this is just a, a piece of pine this is a, a pretty big stump um, I use pine because pine does not reflect the blows back into your arm nearly as uh, easily as oak or a hardwood does um, some people will say, well, pine doesn't last as long. I mean, I've been using this stump for 13 years, and she's still going strong. She probably would outlive me. I've made countless sets of armor on this stump. Uh, this is an awesome stump. So pine is perfectly fine as long as you get it big enough. This stump is, you know, I would say it's probably about 18 inches by 15 inches. It's pretty darn big. Um... I would probably have one about that size if pine was where I was going to go. Um, I have three dishing areas on this stump. I have the major dishing area, which I don't really use that often. I use it mainly if I'm working on a helmet or sometimes if I'm working on a male backplate. Uh, but that's about it. It's it's really it's a, got about a 6 inch by 6 inch diameter, um, 2 inches deep dishing surface and it's just there's very few things that ever call for this to be there this really comes more from my uh, my uh, period um, armoring days but it's still there and I still use it on rare occasions this one is what I primarily use um, it's got about a three let me move the camera back a little bit so you can see it a touch better there you go it's got about a three by three inch dishing area that goes down about an inch and a half, an inch to an inch and a half. Um, that's where I do most of my dishing. It, I call this my medium dishing area, and you can see how it's sloped around from all the dishing. This is uh, my lighter dishing area. It's kind of harder to see, but it is there. If you look for that light area, that's it. It's a really shallow, very very shallow depression. But it's there, I promise. Um, I use that mainly for some finishing uh, dishing that has to happen, or if I have to go back and dish something later. Um, that's what this area here is for. Um, some other areas to talk about on here. Uh, this area right over here, right here, is for a stake. It's for a square bottom stake. This area here is for a round bottom stake. Um, I use I use these for forming stakes, primarily this one because I can put my auto body dolly stakes in there for forming. Um, I don't do a lot of forming on the, st on the dishing stump. I'll use it to maybe do some basic um, um, knocking out of deep hammer marks and things of that nature. That's what these, like the, this real dark area right here on the stump. Lift, the, lift it up here so you can see it. This area right here, I usually use this for uh, this area and this area through here for uh, um, if I need to uh, after I dish I'll use the uh, the flatter side of the hammer to kind of knock out some of the hammer marks and and get a straighter a more flat surface okay 
That way it doesn't look like uh, the surface of the moon, okay? So that's my dishing stump. Um, she does rest on some 2x4s and uh, casters, so I can wheel her around if I need to. Um, so she is mobile. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that's her, and uh, that's that's this is really where the magic happens, okay? So we've got our dishing stump, we, or we've got our dishing surface out of the way. I'm going to go over the, the, the two hammers that, in my opinion, make the most difference for the beginner smith. You don't necessarily need this hammer as much as you need this hammer. But this is a ball-peen hammer right here, okay? Um, it's called a ball-peen hammer because it has a ball end, and it also has a peening end. Peening is just an old word. Um, that uh, you know when you when you peen metal together usually you're, you're folding it together or you're um, like we peen down rivets in order we smash down rivets so that it holds the metal together so that's the peening end that's the end that you're uh, really going to be flattening and and, and uh, that kind of stuff with and then of course your ball end is where you're going to be doing your dishing with that end now my suggestion on purchasing one of these types of hammers would be to find a local yard sale, a local garage sale, an estate sale, a farm that might be getting auctioned off, or an old flea market, not a new flea market, but an old flea market where you can get these old forged tools. These type of hammers make the very best hammers imaginable. You can also... Um, uh, rework them you know you can reforge them into different types of hammers as well but uh, for the for the beginner you want these old style hammers they're just a much easier hammer to deal with they're a lot easier to keep up they sh the, the ends shine up easier they take a lot of abuse if the handle breaks you can find a new handle I mean it's so much you know they're just easier the second kind of hammer that I would suggest to get is this uh, soft and rubber ended um, mallet now the soft rubber end is primarily going to be used for dishing. Um, I use it mostly. That's what I make the plates with when I do the dishing is with this soft rubber end because it does, you know, it will do the dishing without adding a bunch of mar and uh, dents to the metal. So it's less work. Yeah, you have to hit the metal a little harder and you may have to make a few more passes. But in all honesty, this is much less work than having to get all those dents out. Now, um, if I need a really, really, really deep dish, I'm going to use this hammer, okay? This hammer will not do a super deep dish. Um, it's only going to do, you know, probably up to a medium dish, which is about what most people are going to use on their torso plates. So, um, and then I, I use the rubber end somewhat for flattening back, flattening the metal back out. I mean, if, you know, to get some of the hammer marks out, but not as much. Um, I primarily just use the soft rubber end. You can get this kind of hammer at just about any um, any hardware store, cheap hardware store. It doesn't have to be a super expensive hammer. Some people also use rawhide mallets um, instead of either of these mallets. They use a weighted rawhide mallet, which I've heard works well. I've never used one. I'm pretty happy with the ones that I have, and these are not very expensive hammers, either one of them. And they've lasted forever. I mean, you know, this hammer I've had, the ball pin hammer I've had for 13 years. This hammer I've had for nine, and it's still going strong. What you do, though, you want to make sure that you round out. You want to round the edges on that rubber, the soft rubber side, so that it will dish, okay? The next thing you're going to need is your forming stake, okay? Forming stake, very important. That's what helps us get the form into the actual armor, okay? So, forming stake, and then um, uh, you can also use this for planishing. This stake right here is actually a um, it's actually a trailer hitch, believe it or not. This was a trailer hitch ball that uh, had a flat top that I was able to grind down and round off. So it's nice and round, and it's just as smooth as the surface of the hammer because again if you have imperfections on the surface of your forming stake or your hammer that's going to transfer right back to the metal and you don't want that nobody wants that it's not fun to have to deal with um, fixing those 
um, you know, all those little hammer marks that you're going to get, because trust me, you will get them. Um, then your next tool that you're going to want is a cutting tool. Okay, these are just standard tin snips. You're going to, um, you can just buy the regular kind. These are going to be good for cutting up to, you can cut 16 gauge steel, not easily. You'll definitely work your forearms, but you can do it. Um, and uh, it's, you know, it's it's not an easy thing to do. I actually, my first set of armor, well, I'm sorry, the my the set of armor that I wear now, which is, uh, I still wear my Mark II uh, torso, I'm sorry, my Mark III torso plates. Um, that, those plates are 12 gauge 5053 aluminum, which is, I think, like a step or two below aircraft aluminum that I cut with a pair of tin snips. I did not have the nice um, electric throatless shears back then. I used a pair of tin snips, and oh my gosh, my arms hated me. I mean, I, I could really only cut about one piece a day. It was just that brutal, okay? So um, my recommendation is don't try to go crazy and cut really, really, really thick metal with these tin snips the one of two things is going to happen either you're going to you're going to feel the pain or you even break them you know they will break they're metal they're not you know they're not uh they're not uh, forever tools they will break uh there's several different types of snips uh these are just standard long nose snips they also make a shorter nose called a bulldog snip that's better for cutting through thicker metals although you don't get quite as big of a, a long of a cut so it does take a little bit longer they also make a, a bigger pair of shears that is looks more like a huge pair of scissors. Um, I don't really recommend those. I've had a pair. They're not that great. I mean, they're just not. They're kind of cumbersome. Um, I decided against using them, and I think I gave them away, or they may even be somewhere around here in a drawer that I just I never opened because I don't like them. <laughs> but uh, we'll go over them one more time. You've got your ball peen hammer. You've got your hard and soft rubber hammer, rubber mallet. You've got your forming stake, which is basically just a ground down trailer hitch. That's the El Cheapo version. Um, and then you've got your cutting tool, which is your tin snips. So those are your, and, and oh, we can't forget our dishing surface, the most important thing, the most important thing. So those are our five um, main tools. You've got four hand type tools and you've got your dishing surface. So those are, are your main tools for getting started um, in the workshop. And if you have these these five tools, you can't go wrong. You can, you can at least get your set started and you can even start working on metal commissions at a basic level. I wouldn't go out and advertise to the world, hey, I can make metal armor after you've made your first set. You know, you know, maybe uh, make another set for a friend. Have a friend, you know, buy the metal, and you help, you know, you work with them and knock it out, and you're learning more, and they're actually learning the skill as well. So that would be my advice: is you know, before you do a set and then feel like you're a master armor smith, do a few. You know, you really need to do more than one set. I didn't start selling metal armor. Um, until I had made, I believe I was on my fifth set when I sold my first set of metal armor. And the only reason I sold that set was because I had already started working on it as just a, Hey, I'm going to work on a set of armor. And I started working on it and I had posted pictures of it on, I think this was way back in the day. Um, I was, po I posted a picture, maybe even on MySpace. Yeah, yeah, there used to be a thing before Facebook called MySpace, and I posted some pictures of it on there, and maybe even on the all the, all the Mercs forums at the time, and a member of Mercs said, hey, I want that, I want to buy that set. So I said, okay, and I sold it to her. Um, and then that, that was my first sold set of armor. So don't think you're going to knock out one or two sets and you're going to be a master at it. You need to definitely work on your technique starting out and these are the tools that will get you to a level to where you can start making armor for others okay so that's it for the um the necessary tools next we'll talk about 
our safety equipment. All right, let's talk about safety equipment in the shop. And since we're starting off at the basic level here, let's talk about the basic safety equipment that you're going to need um, to keep from really hurting yourself in the shop. One thing to remember is we're going to be working with metal. Metal is not forgiving when it comes to your body. It is going to hurt you. It is going to test you. It is going to make you scream out in pain on a regular basis. It's going to make you curse life itself. So let's just go ahead and get that out of the way so that you're going to be ready for the trials and tribulations ahead, which is working on metal armor. <laughs> now, if I haven't scared you off with all of that, uh, let's go ahead and talk about uh, the safety equipment, the proper safety equipment that you're going to need to do this. It's pretty simple. It's nothing nothing uh, major as far as equipment. It's mostly common sense safety equipment, okay? The first thing, and the absolute most important thing when it comes to safety in the workshop, is them eyes. Because the eyes are not things that are easily replaced. You know, not that I'm advocating cutting a finger off, but if you cut a finger off, there's a decent chance the hospital can sew it back on. If you put out your eye, your eye is not growing back. It's gone. You're now a pirate. You're going to say R the rest of your life because you are down to one eye. Luckily, we, were, we have two. But I don't want to test that, okay? I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. About three years ago, I was working on some upgrades for my kit. In fact, I think it was uh, it was my knee armor that I wear. Um, in fact, it's the knee armor that I that I just uh, got rid of not long ago or replaced. But I was doing some. I was brazing them together, you know, which is basically welding. I was welding them together, and um, the brazing rod hit an area, an impure area on the metal, and it decided to fume. Now, what that means is when it hits this impure area, I mean, just these little metal, molten, liquid hot magma pieces of metal just kind of explode everywhere. So, luckily, they did not get, it didn't get in my eye, or I would have the eye patch already. Um, but I did get a piece stuck in my hair that I did not know about. And I know this sounds really weird, but that's the only place I could think of that it came from. I was wearing my safety glasses, so I was good there. However, when I was shaking my head as I was leaving, I, I was putting, shaking my, you know, running my hand through my hair. I knocked a piece of that bronze that had fumed off of the piece, off of the uh, the knee armor I was working on. I had knocked that little bit that was in my hair off and into my eye. And you know, I tried so hard not to rub it. I tried to wash it out. I used eye drops. I did. I had a, my wife look, you know, in my eye for it, try to dig it out. We could not get it out. So I figured, well, you know, if I just give it some time, maybe, you know, it will just fall out of my eye on its own. I've had that happen in the past. Well, by the time the third day rolled around, my eye was so infected. I just could not take it anymore, and my wife was just, Alicia was just tired of hearing me gripe about it, so she said, go to the eye doctor before I pop your eye out myself. So I did. I went to the eye doctor, and it was funny because I'm sitting there in, in the seat there in the doctor's office, and she's looking in my eye through whatever that eye scope thing is that they, you know, have you put your eyes, you know, have you look in. And she said, well, Mr. Hutchins, I found the, the, the piece that, you know, uh, the piece of metal in here. And she said, yes, I'm glad that it's, it's not a, pe a type of metal that rusts. Because if it was, I would have to buff your cornea after digging it out. Um, the eye is the second fastest healing organ in the body after the tongue. And you, when you get something on your eye or in your eye, your eye actually starts to coat it with... with um, you know, the, with the, the, the flesh that makes the eye up, it starts to coat it and uh, to make it your eyeball smooth again. So um, she had to dig that out. Luckily, it didn't really hurt, but I did have to wear an eye patch for, for you know, a couple days and uh, put steroid drops in my eye. So, yes, eye protection. It is absolutely necessary. 
Um, while you know, while I didn't get it in my eye because I wasn't wearing eye protection, um, I'm telling you that story so that you don't get anything in your eye at all. Um, so yes, eye protection. Sometimes it may even be a better idea to wear the entire full face shield. That might even be the better option. They're not very expensive. Eye protection is not very expensive. You're talking five to ten bucks maybe at your local hardware store. Next most important thing, ear protection. It doesn't have to be these hulking, you know, old 1980s looking stereo headset, um, which that's not what these are, but they kind of look like it. I use these because of the planishing hammer is just so loud. Um, but they can be just the little 3M foam ear, you know, little squishy ear foam um, hearing protection. But you need hearing protection. Um, and maybe not so much for the dishing, but anytime you're working with metal on metal where you get that loud pinging noise, um, you need the ear protection because if not, you'll get what they call tinnitus. And it is basically a permanent ringing in your ear. You want to gouge your eardrums out with a, you know, with a spork. And I just, I don't want to ever have to deal with that, so I prefer to use the hearing protection. Um, these are, are a little bit costly, so I would suggest getting the 3M foam ear um, ear protection, but you can get a pair of these big ones too for, I don't know, 30, 25, 30 bucks, somewhere around in there. Last but not least, hand protection. And hand protection does a better job of saving you um, healing time on your hands. If you use hand protection, the metal will not cut you nearly as, as often or as badly if it does cut you because you've got hand protection. And these are leather gloves. I like to get leather gloves that are small so that they're really snug on my hands so that I can feel the metal. I, I can feel the texture of it. I know this kind of sounds a little weird, but it's just part of the mastering of it. You learn the sounds and, and you learn the feel of it. But I like to get small gloves so that they're nice and tight on me. They almost feel like racing gloves. And uh, that way, um, you know, it doesn't hinder my ability to use um, or, or, you know, it doesn't hinder my ability to to make armor. But um, the other thing about, about gloves also is that they're going to keep you from getting cut. Metal is sharp. Metal is unforgiving on skin. It will cut you. Um, some, the minute you stop respecting how um, easy it is to be cut by metal, the minute you stop respecting the metal itself is the minute the metal cuts your finger off. I don't want that to happen to anybody, so use gloves, please. I'm asking you to use gloves. You have been warned, and, and that's that. But this is your basic shop safety equipment. Um, if you have a big shop, you may want to get like a fire extinguisher or things of that nature. I keep that kind of stuff out here. First aid kit is always great to have. A small first aid kit with some band-aids, some kind of, uh, you know, uh, triple ointment. Um, but gauze, band-aids, things of that nature because you will get cut. And you need something to, to, you know, to wrap your, your cuts up in. Um, but these are the basics. Seeing eye protection, hearing protection. Hand protection. Before we get into the basics of uh, dishing and planishing, let's go ahead and um, just do a brief overview of what metal to use for your armor. Now, I've got three types of metal here. Two of these metals you're going to use. One of these metals is not like the other, <laughs> and you're not going to want to use it. Um, it's that, and we'll start with that one. It's it's this metal right here. This is galvanized steel. Okay. Um, it's undergone a process, a, a galvanization process, that has made it um, resistant to corrosion. All right, so uh, it's not corrosion proof, it's just corrosion resistant. Uh, galvanized metal will corrode over time, but, uh, you know, it just takes a lot longer to oxidize than it does regular uh, mild or high carbon steel. Um, the reason why you don't want to use... Uh, galvanized metal is because if you have to heat it, um, it gives off very toxic fumes that are like super bad. It's like, a, I believe it's like a chlorine or formaldehyde or maybe it's even both type of gas. Um, and chlorine only belongs in your pool and formaldehyde only belongs in, you know, 
uh, embalmed uh, embalming solution. So do not use galvanized metal. It's great to use maybe on some props where you just need to rivet some uh, some pieces of metal together. Not great for making armor. I do not suggest it. It's fairly it's pretty flimsy. As you can see, it's it's pretty flimsy, and when it creases, you cannot get that crease out. It's very similar to aluminum in that sense that the crease, um, when it does crease, it's, it creases just about for good. So, so we don't use galvanized metal here. I've got I just have some pieces as examples of what not to do. Um, for most for the most part, you're going to be using steel. Now this is a uh, this is a I believe a 16 gauge. Um, cold rolled steel uh, cold rolled is just the uh, the extruding method by which it's uh, it's made you've got two different kinds you've got hot roll and uh, you've got cold roll cold roll is uh, is a little bit harder than hot roll is when it comes to working um, it uh, you know it, it does come out a little bit harder uh, from the roll you know when they cut it so um, it's it's just because it's just the way that they make it. They I, I believe that they uh, cut it at a um, at a lower temperature. You know, it's not allowed to anneal like hot roll is. Uh, hot roll steel is basically the same thing. It's just allowed to anneal a bit so it's softer. And annealing is just a process which uh, you apply heat to relieve stress, and it makes the metal a little bit soft. Cold roll does not like that. It's harder. Um, and it's really not that much different to work with than hot roll of the same thickness. Um, the other cool thing about a cold roll that I like is that it doesn't, it tends not to uh, oxidize as bad as hot roll does. Hot roll, when you get it in or when you buy it, it's going to have quite a bit of rust on it normally when you get it, uh, unless you're just lucky enough to get it from the, the steel foundry right off of a roll, and uh, you're probably not going to get that. So, um, this is the metal that we're going to be working with today, this specific piece. So uh, that's that's the metal you're going to want to use. Try to stick with them with what it's just called mild steel, cold rolled mild steel, or hot rolled mild steel. Uh, the next type of um, metal that we have here is aluminum. Okay, this is a 5053 aluminum, which is extremely strong. Um, it's I believe it's one, maybe two, but I'm pretty sure it's one step down from uh, aircraft grade aluminum. This was actually an old stop. I believe it was an old stop sign. It might even have been uh, a scrap from when I made my armor years ago, because I still have a lot of scraps from that stuff. But um, this is extremely thick. If you put it up next to, if you put it up next to the steel, you can see the thickness difference. It's very thick. It's easily, you know, you're talking easily three times, well, probably twice as thick. This is 12 gauge steel. Uh, this is 12 gauge aluminum. Okay, versus 16 gauge steel so this is going to be much much thicker now um, you can see the cut areas where I've used the uh, the electric shear to cut through it I'm gonna tell you beforehand this stuff is a real dog to cut through okay it is very tough um, I do not suggest trying to use snips to cut through it um, you will hate yourself for doing that uh, it's very difficult to cut. It's very difficult to hammer and form. But if you just want to try it, um, you know, if you want to try to make your, your armor out of this, go ahead and do that. Now, I don't suggest using street signs unless you have uh, unless you have a, a Department of Transportation near you, where you can go and buy signs that have been hit by cars and mangled up pretty bad. Sometimes they will sell them to you if you go and ask nicely. Um, I bought a few signs way back in the day because I knew people at the DOT. Um, don't go stealing them off of signposts. You will get in trouble. You will go to court. You may even go to jail. So uh, I'm definitely not suggesting that anybody go and steal sign metal. But there's another thing, too. You can always tell the type of metal by the noise that it makes. With steel, you get a ring. Kind of hear that ring. With aluminum, you do not get that ring. You get more of a dull kind of kind of a dull clank ring clank so that's one way you can tell the thick metals apart um, it's also much lighter the aluminum is a lot lighter than the steel um, it's probably you know yeah this is a, a decent sized piece but this is also twice as thick this aluminum so 
you know you would think they'd be pretty close to the same weight but the aluminum is is definitely lighter than the steel um, that's just because of the metals you know aluminum is a lighter metal so anyway that's our uh, that's just a brief overview of the metals like I say stick with the steel especially when you're just starting out um, you're gonna get a lot uh, a lot more um, bang for the buck and and you're gonna be a lot happier with your your end product if you do cut alright so we're gonna go ahead and do some uh, basic dishing and uh, very basic planishing on our piece of steel here now uh, let's not forget our gloves and normally what I usually do is um, unless I'm I'm using the planishing hammer where I have to have a glove on both hands I usually use a glove on one hand and that way I can hold the metal with one hand and I can use the hammer with the other and uh, it just seems to work better that way it's a little bit difficult to for me to hammer with a glove on so uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you the pattern in which I like to dish okay so I'm gonna use the trusty sharpie here and I'm just gonna I'm just gonna make some circles here and the way I like to dish the way I was taught to dish and people are you know different people are taught different methods this is the way that I was taught and it's the way I teach others but I like to dish from the outside in okay and work my way in from the outside so we start around the outside edge we'll make a pass alright we'll take a look at it to see if maybe any of the edges might be curling or folding up and need to be dealt with and then we will make another pass and we'll do the same thing and then we'll make another pass and we'll do the same thing and then we'll we'll do the middle so hopefully the camera does not shake while I'm doing this but it is quite a bit of, of uh, uh, pressure so the floor might you know my, my shop here is up off the ground a little bit so it may shake just a touch and uh, if it does that's okay we'll just deal with it as best we can alright so let's go ahead we're gonna start on this outside edge and we're gonna work our way around now I'm using the ball peen hammer for this I could use the rubber mallet if I wanted to but I'm just gonna stick with the ball peen hammer since that's what you should really be using as your starting hammer alright so let's go ahead what we want to do here is we're gonna use I'm using the medium dish or the medium dishing uh, impression so I'm going to put this edge right up to the edge of the impression here you right here's the edge in fact it doesn't hurt for me to mark this out here. I'm going to mark this dishing impression edge. The dishing impression edge is right through here. Okay, right where I made that line. So I'm going to line this up with that Sharpie line that I just made. And if you need to do that for yourself, you can do it too. It'll make a really great guide uh, for, for dishing and doing all this hammering. You don't want to have to, uh, you don't want this to slip. You don't want to miss hit it if you can help it, you know. Um, one thing you're going to want to do, a lot of people like to go way back on the hammer when they strike. I'm not a fan of doing that. The, it's just like playing baseball. The further back you grip the bat, the least control you have of it, or the less control you have. The further up you grip it, the more control you have. It's not necessarily about how much power you're, you're putting into this piece of metal. It's it's where you're putting the power and how concentrated that power is and how accurate your your hammer blows are so choke up a bit you know and and put your thumb there on the back of it it really gives you some good control and you don't have to rear back like you're chopping down an oak tree you know you just just come up a few inches and you know I would say four maybe five inches at the most for starters and later on when you get real good you can go slow or you can get lower and you can go with uh, shorter strokes but you know come up about four or five inches and that let that be your uh, hammer height so let's go ahead and get started on this and we'll make our first pass and then we'll look at it we'll check to see how it looks uh, we'll look and see if we've got any folds we need to deal with and then we'll go from there all right
All right. So that was pretty simple. All right. Normally I would be standing up doing this, but for the camera I'm pretty much having to sit down. Um, but yeah, when you hit it around the outside edge, we've got around that first pass there, and you can already see when you turn it over, it's already starting to kind of take a slight bowl shape. All right. And these, of course, are your hammer marks. We'll have to we'll get rid of we'll work on getting rid of those a little bit later when I show you how to planish. So let's go ahead and let's start working in our next zone here, which is this one, okay? And we're going to move, we're going to try to uh, get this line, this next uh, line into our dishing area. We're going to try to get it as even as we think it might be with uh, this over here on the impression area. And I always put my finger back here and kind of lift up a bit. That seems to help. It just makes it, at least with me, it feels like it helps with a dishing process. And again, try to keep those hammer blows in this area. If you deviate out a little bit, it won't hurt anything, but try to really control those hammer blows. All right, now we've gone around that that next area, and as you can see, it's starting to really it's starting to really push down. But we've got a couple areas here that we need to attend to before we uh, before we go any further. And right here, you're going to see a little fold is starting to form right here. See that right here? And then we've got another one that's starting to form here going up. So we've got a fold that's going down, another one that's going up. We need to attend to those. Now, the easiest way I've always found to attend to those is I just move it back to this flat area here, okay? And I just I just lightly go over it. I don't want to go over it too much because if I do that, it's going to knock some of the curve out. And I don't want to knock out, you know, all the curve. I want to keep the curve, but I want to try to flatten this metal. So I'm just going to go ahead and go over the entire edge area here and that way that will help take out some of that folding that's going on it won't take out all of it completely we'll have to remove some more later but it does as you can see it does remove a good portion of it all right so let's move on to our next dishing area and for this I am going to stand up because I need to hold it on the outside now this is going to get a little bit more difficult because as we're going inside here, we're kind of having to move our metal around. So for this one, I'm going to leave it, I'm going to still line it up, this outside edge with the Sharpie mark there, but I'm going to make sure that I hit in this area here, okay, in this third dishing circumference, all right, or the third dishing uh, diameter. Okay, so let's look at this. See, now we're starting to get kind of a conical shape, which is what we want. We're starting to get that bowl, sort of cone bowl looking shape. And that's exactly what you want with this. Because that's what's adding in our, our curve. I know it's hard to see it right now. There's a lot of hammer marks. But we'll see it as we go. Now for this, for the inside here... I'm just going to hold the outside, and all I'm going to do is I'm, I'm literally letting the center rest right in the middle of the depressed, the dishing area with the depressed area here. And I'm just going to go around here, and I'm just going to whack it uh, several times. All right. Let's see. All right. Now let's take a look at it. Okay. So. Here we go. It's kind of taking on the shape of a, of a little satellite dish almost. It's got that that concave look to it. Now, ideally, what we would do here is we would continue to go around it. And 
And what I normally do on these second passes and such is I tend to, tend to stick more towards the inside and not the outside. You're going to see the outside start to fold up a bit um, because most of your dishing is going to take place. Most of your uh, curve is going to happen as you hit it more towards the center. So... All right, now we've got a nice, really nice curved piece here. And you can see how it's got that nice complex curve. It's got vertical curve, and it's got horizontal curve. So now what we need to do is clean up these edges a bit. You don't want to go too long in dishing before you clean your edges up. So we're just going to clean, flatten this out a little bit. But when I do this, I do it similar to how we started dishing. I'm going to put it on, and I'm going to hit it on the edge that's touching the actual surface of the wood here, of the stump. What that does is that actually forces the metal, instead of making it flat, you know, flat going out, it actually makes it flat and it's stressing it more towards the inside. It's pushing itself inward. So it continues to keep the nice bowl shape and it doesn't flatten out. And you don't have to, again, swing the hammer really hard to make this happen. You can see here I'm lifting the hammer maybe two inches total. It's not about how hard you hit, it's about how well you hit. Now look at that. We can really see that nice bowl. In fact, let me open up my little quenching bucket here, and you can see exactly how well this thing is dished. There, you have a little bowl, a little steel bowl. And of course, it's, <laughs> it's a very shallow bowl, but nonetheless, if you'd have put water on that piece of metal when we first started, it would have just ran right off. So let's dump this back in here. All right, so now let's take another pass at it real quick. We're going to try to make it a little bit, a little bit, a uh, little bit deeper than what it is. So we're going to take another pass here on this side. We're going to start from here, not here, but the second round here, our second diameter of dishing. We're going to work there to the third and then back on the inside. We've done all we can on the outside for now. And then we're just going to keep going. We're going to gently work our way in. And then we're going to work our way all the way to the center. We have a fairly nice bowl going on at this point. It's mostly even. It almost kind of looks like a little bit of a, a turtle shell with this texture on it here. So let's go back here. and We're going to work this edge a little bit more. We gently, it's almost like coaxing. Now when you get good at this, and you can transition to the rubber mallet, you'll have a lot less of this work to do. Oh, so much less. Alright, now, our edges are fairly straight. We may have a little bit of wave there, but we'll take that out when we start our planishing here shortly. But we've got a nice, very nice looking little bowl here out of that disc. Now, one thing to remember is that this metal has been stretched, okay? Now, if we hit it, the metal 
uh, differs in tone once it's dished. You remember how it sounded when I had the piece of aluminum here and how it had that nice ring to it? Well, now it doesn't so much have that ring. It's got more of a sharp kind of shrill Kind of sounds like a golf ball when you bounce a golf ball off concrete. You know, and the reason why that is is twofold. One, of course, now it's in more of a dome shape. It's not flat anymore, so you don't get the ring. Um, the sound waves kind of bounce around a little bit differently. The second is because the metal has been stretched, okay, and now it's undergone more stress. So it's actually more stressed than it was before. So it kind of has that more um, hollow sound to it, I guess you could say. Or maybe, yeah, it's kind of a hollow. You know, it's got that, it, it sounds like a more dense object um, pinging against something else. Like I said, like a golf ball. You know how a golf ball has a solid core and how it sounds when you throw it against a piece of, of smooth concrete. It's got that same sound. Well, that's that's the way this is when you've, steel is once you've dished it. So, all right, so let's go ahead and we'll pop the planishing stake here in. This is the one I use for planishing, which is just a auto body dolly. It's a half football shaped auto body dolly. And now what we're going to do, and my plan is not to planish this perfectly. It's just to take some of the hammer marks out of here. Now we're going to use the flat side of the hammer, of course, and you're going to want to... Um, you're going to want to go with the curve of the metal on this stake. That's why it's imperative to have a rounded stake, okay? Because you're going to want the curve to flow with the rounded area of the stake. So we're going to put it on the stake, and we're going to start doing just little little taps, okay? Small taps. That is literally how high you want to be striking this. We're talking maximum one inch. And you've got to go over every bit of this surface area, okay? Because you're going to want to get all of those um, hammer marks and nooks and crannies out. So, planishing is by far the most tedious part of armoring. If this is something that you do get into, and tr I would love to see more people doing making metal Mandalorian armor even if you're selling it I, I really don't it doesn't bother me um, I'm not I don't care about uh, competition and things of that nature I don't really sell enough of it to be competitive in my opinion um, but you're gonna find as the more you do this the more you're gonna want to get a solution to make things easier uh, once you get very good at making the armor, my suggestion would be to get a pneumatic planishing hammer. Um, I would not get one until you have at least, um, I won't say mastered planishing, but once you've done it enough to where you feel really good about it, then maybe get a planishing hammer, uh, a pneumatic planishing hammer. But until then, just starting out, use your ball peen hammer, use the peening side, and go over all this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grab a different hammer for myself here because, there we go, I'm going to use one of my Petting Haas hammers. These are actually very expensive hammers. These are like $50 a piece hammers, but it's much, much easier for me because it's a little bit lighter. But this is actually, uh, this is a planishing hammer. That's exactly what this is for.
the other great thing about about planishing is that while you're doing it, you're actually forming up the metal as well. You're giving it a little bit better form. One thing about planishing too is you're going to know if you're not hitting the metal in the right place, like over here, you're going to know because it's going to start kicking up. It's not going to feel right. Planishing is going to feel right because you're going to you're going to hear that. You're going to hear nice, solid hits, and that's what you want. It doesn't have to be chopping down a tree strength. Like I said, I'm, I'm maybe going an inch high total. But it's absolutely imperative that you go over the entire surface of your piece when you do this. And I'm not kidding when I say you're going to build up some really good forearm strength because you really, really will. Let's go ahead and look at I'm going to let you see here. See how you can see the big globby hammer areas here but right around here we've got these much smaller marks of course you're still going to have some marks here but it's a lot smoother all right and again i'm choked up really far on this hammer because I really want the control. You don't have to worry about hammer, you know, strong hammer hits when you're planishing. See, we've almost got it to the we've, we're almost to the center here okay we're really close almost almost done left is just about one uh, one inch in diameter here left to do Now we take a look at it. You want to feel it just to feel how it is. There may be some areas that need some work. I don't really have to do this. This is actually really smooth. I'm just trying to make sure this curve is really nice in here. And at this point, our curve is extremely even. 
I'm just going to set this down so you can get a good look at it. Our curve is very even. Is it smooth? It's a heck of a lot smoother than it was. You run over this with your with your sander and sand this out real nice and smooth, and it's going to be really, really, uh, it's going to be a really smooth piece of, of uh, metal. But it's a nice, uh, nice bowl shape. Turn this here so you can see it. It's a really nice bowl shape at this point. It'll hold, uh, I'm sure it'll hold plenty of water. But, uh, there you go. That's a, that's a good, uh, a good gauge for how, how much of a, a dish is in that. Very nice, complex curve. This is the perfect kind of curve that you want on your armor in the areas where curve is required. Chest armor, collar plate, gut plate, uh, shoulder shoulder bells, um, thigh plates, back plate. The only place you don't have to dish are cod plates, knee armor, and uh, uh, you don't have to do any dishing on boot armor. Although I like to, um, I like to do a little bit of forming work right at the uh, at the area that touches the top of your ankle I like to kind of upturn that slightly for for comfort but but uh, the bulk of um, Mandalorian armor you're, that you make out of metal you're gonna be dishing and planishing so you better get used to it <laughs> um, practice find you some scrap metal before you even start working on your armor find you some scrap pieces cut out some circles like this because I feel like that's always been the best way um, uh, to learn the armor to learn the dishing and the planishing part of armoring cut out some circles and um, start plan start dishing and planishing them out you do that you will get very good at dishing and planishing and um, here's a now you still hear the can still hear that that nice kind of clanky clank but now when you hit it against another piece of metal you can really hear it now but it also has when it's not uh, when the when the sound waves aren't being um, uh, muffled, it does have a nice a nice ring to it. These are sounds that you want to learn to listen to. I'll let you listen to what a, an undished piece of metal sounds like when it's just sitting on a, on on the wood here. All right, here's a piece of this is 18 gauge. That's just sitting on the wood nothing going on you have to learn how to listen to the metal the metal will talk to you I know this is sound this sounds really weird and maybe freakishly deep but it's true the metal will talk to you it'll tell you when you've done a good job and when you hear the golf ball sound and the nice ring you know you have dished and planished your armor well if this was not planished well and it still had all those lumps in it you wouldn't get that you wouldn't get that nice uh, ringing reverberation going on there it's because it's planished and it's nice and, and uh, fairly smooth that you're getting that. Okay, and because it's dished and it's it's compressed now, you know you've got stress on it from from stretching it and then pushing it back on itself. That's why we have the golf ball. Otherwise, you got that, and uh, that's just raw metal sound. To be honest with you. So my challenge to you uh, for the next 30 days, I'm going to send you off with a little bit of homework. Um, if you're going to watch 
these 301 episodes, then I might as well give you some homework. My challenge for you over the next uh, 30 days is to, of course, get your tools, get all the tools that you need for your dishing and your planishing. And um, I'd like to see uh, what you can make as far as your uh, your dishing and your planishing goes. I want to see how well uh, you can do it. And, uh, you know, go find yourself some scrap metal, uh, cut yourself some circles out of it, and, uh, you know, start working on your dishing and your planishing. And uh, let's just see how well you can do. Um, you can post uh, what you make on my Facebook page. Uh, if you go to Facebook, just look up Mandalore the Uniter. You can, uh, you can either message me over Facebook there, or you can... Um, uh, just post pictures of what you've made directly to the page. Um, it's open for that. And uh, I just I want to see how well you've absorbed this episode, how well you can uh, you know, how well you can do this. If you need to go back and watch it a few more times, feel free. Um, of course, it's on YouTube, so you can watch it anytime you want. Um, if you would like to support continued uh, Warmaster Workshop episodes, you can do so from my Patreon page. Uh, just go to uh, patreon.com and look for Warmaster's Workshop. I'll also have a link down in the description where you can go. I've got several really cool reward tiers. Uh, some of them are even armor rewards. So um, if you like these, if, uh, if you would like to support the, the, uh, the ability for them to be made, none of this stuff is free. It comes out of my pocket. So uh, in order to do that, there's, you know, money has to be involved to do it. I wish everything was free, but the, unfortunately this ain't Star Trek. This is Star Wars, and nothing's free in Star Wars. Um, anyway, so uh, yeah, I want to see what you can do over the next 30 days. Uh, make, me some, uh, make me some bowls. Make me some steel bowls or even aluminum if you want to use aluminum. But I want to see what you do. The, everybody that posts one, I will definitely comment on uh, how well your work – has been done and I'll give you some pointers and uh, I'll give some some good shout outs to everybody that uh, you know that actually takes the time to uh, to do the work so um, until uh, until the next episode uh, it's Tom Hutchins uh, Mandalore the Uniter uh, signing off and uh, we'll see you in the workshop <laughs>